So for Labor Day weekend, I struck off in search of cooler weather up north and uh, went up to Hiawassee, Georgia. We took up in the hills. Up in the hills. Uh, they're about 30 minutes north of Helen and uh, went up there camping with the family at a place called Bald Mountain Camping Resort and uh, had a good time. And we were up there. What I like to do when I go to the mountains is um, I like to, in the mornings, I like to go riding around a little bit and then come home and then kind of just relax, build me a fire, play in the creek the rest of the day. We did a good bit of that. But we run up on a farm stand there right outside of Hiawassee, uh, between Hiawassee and um, right outside the outskirts there. And uh, Little Light had some nice produce went in there and they had some really good stuff. I mean, they had heirloom tomatoes, they had peas, they had dragon tongue beans. I mean, they had all kind of great, great looking produce. And they had these sitting outside. And at first I thought it was a gourd, but uh, then got talking to a fella and this is a Kushaw squash. It uh, slung a craving on you, did it? Well, I ain't never seen one this big. Now, from what I understood, these things can easily get 10 to 15 pounds. But uh, I had no idea they could get this big. This one here, I checked it on the scale earlier, 35 pounds. Now he told me uh, that he reckoned I could get about 15 pies out of this one. And that may be a low ball estimate there. So what he's saying is a pie per two pounds. Something like that. I believe it's, it's a bunch of meat in there, I guarantee. Yeah. I don't know how you'd cut it. You need your good machete. Look at that stem in there. I mean, you ain't gonna cut that with pruners. It'd take a husky body to cut that off with it. Or some good, good loppers one. Here, I'll turn it around. Let's turn it. Ooh. Well, the bottom where it was grown right there. You can see where it was. Yeah. There. <laughs> but they had a, a table full of them. This was the biggest one they had. They was all fifteen dollars a piece. I thought that was I thought that was cheap. I believe you could easily get thirty dollars for some of them. But um, a lot of people use it for ornamental decorations. However, well, that's what he told us. He said, "Use it for your decoration, and then when you're done decorating, uh, eat it, eat it up." But uh, so I can get this variety. It's called a green striped kushaw. There's also an orange striped kushaw, but I have never seen or heard of them getting this big. And um, I'm gonna try to grow some. I'm gonna save the seeds from these, and uh, I'm gonna try to get some more seeds so we can carry this variety. But I'm gonna grow specifically the seeds from this one, and uh, next year, and see what happens. You know, if you had you a, even a small plot full of these, you better eat you a big old bowl of cereal before you get out there harvesting them things in the morning. Yeah, you make a man out of it. You know. I don't believe my storage rack, uh, no, I wouldn't my hardware cloth could hold it. Yeah. You got to put these rascals on a picnic table or somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's what they had them sitting on was the picnic table. And uh, they had some Cinderella pumpkins out there. They had a few jack-o'-lanterns. And he said they was having, in the next few weeks, they'd have a lot more stuff like this coming in. So, uh, they were doing some good. I've seen a few good gardens riding around Hiawassee. And uh, neat stuff being grown up there like this. You don't even see stuff like this down here. No, and uh, I was up there last year. I ended up over in Blairsville, a little, little farmer's market over there, and they had a lot of unique stuff there too. Georgia candy roaster, a lot of those up there. We don't see them around here. Right. You know, those unique stuff that uh, the mountain folks always crowed, I guess. Yeah, up there, and uh, I know in Tennessee too, they have a lot better luck growing these kind of things than we do. In the fall. Yeah. The fall crop, correct. Yeah, yeah, they can grow them off a lot better. Um, but it was nice and cool up there. And then I got back here, and it's kind of, I ain't seen it struck off cool, but it's cooled down a good bit. Um, I was shooting a video planting beans. Nice and cool outside. I looked at my radar. It's not supposed to get over 90 anymore, that I can tell. Next week is going to break. Supposed to get in the 60s at night pretty soon, and uh, I can feel it coming. Yeah, you know, as this time of the year, it's always kind of warm. I'm set this here. rascal up here. And we have. A, I'm going to speak for myself. Here. I have a tendency to be a little hold off a little bit on planting my fall garden stuff in the greenhouse because it's still real warm. And it gets hot in there. It's hot in there, and I keep forgetting. In just a few weeks, this, this weather pattern is going to change. So it's kind of hard for me to transition from summertime to fall. 
planting ahead in the greenhouse plant. That's always a yeah. tough one for me. I got my onions planted in the greenhouse. I mean, it was hot the other day when I planted my onions, but it was time. Yeah. So while we was up there, back on my trip, at this same farmer's market, they had all kind of goodies. They had a whole wall of canned goodies and they was stuff I didn't even know folks canned up there. But I bought us some more kind of traditional stuff and got us some um, old fashioned apple cider here. This is good stuff. This is actually made of a company called Hillside Orchard in Tiger, Georgia. And uh, Tiger is kind of up there around uh, close to Black Rock Mountain where I'm going to be um, in October. But I figured we'd try some of these snacks here. We got some hot pickled okra. Mm. Mm. And we got some pickled beets. So if the okra is too hot, we'd cool it off with a pickled mm. beet. Now I let this here. That's got me worried. See that big orange? Hot on That top. smells good right here. Now you can drink this stuff. It ain't got to be chilled, but I chilled this. Yeah, I like mine chilled too. I love it. Outside. Not vinegar, but outside. And this will do, do your belly right too. Oh yeah. I got a feeling I'm going to need some of that when I get through that hot okra. That's pretty good. That's good and thick there. It says it's pasteurized. Mm -hmm. Got to get a flavor to it. So let's dig in. You get on the beet. You, you open up the beets. And I haven't tried these yet. They don't smell too hot. Get your okra first. That looks like I might be some clips and spineless right there. not bad at all. That is actually pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. This just got a little bit of spice to it. It ain't bad at all. No, it ain't bad. It's a little on the end. That's not, it's not hot, hot. There's some little bitty baby beets right baby, there. Baby, that's kind you grow them baby beets. Mm. That's perfect size for a cracker right there. Mm-hmm. A little piece of cheese. Anyway, I got good groceries up there. They go grow good food. You really need you some saltine crackers to be partaking like we are right here. Yeah, sure do. I love going to the mountains this time of year. I can't get up there enough. Yeah. I had a fellow call me from Macon one day this week and said he was moving up there and then made up his mind. I said, I've crossed my mind a time or two. <laughs> yeah. It don't, um, it crosses, I get up there, and now I don't, you know, when it's up there snowing, you can't get around nowhere, I imagine that's tough, but this time of year, it's enjoyable. I could, I could be up there for a while, yep. and my thing is, I about went broke on firewood, I'm going to have to get me a better, mm -hmm. it'll tear you up on some firewood yeah, up there. You love to fire, don't you? Man, I sure do. Um, so, that was fun to do over Labor Day weekend, let me show you what else I got right here. So, I got uh, three little arrangements I made based on some of my zinnias I got growing here. I better not leave them too close over there. You'll be going to eat all my snacks. So, here we got, uh, I planted several different varieties of zinnias. And uh, let me see if I can get them in the center of the camera there. So, here we got our binary giants. And that's the ones that make the big old... Like that right there, that's your perfect big old bloom. You had a roach come out of your flowers right uh -oh, there. Uh-oh, did you get him? No, but not him. Whop him. Got him? Yeah. Anyhow, these, the Benary Giants make the big old really pretty blooms like we see there. And this is our mix with all the different colors. So we got pink, yellow, orange, so forth. Now this one here is our key lime pie mix with just the lime and the white and I really like that combination there but I think my new favorite is this one here the ice queen zinnia and uh, I have a tendency to call it ice cream zinnia for some reason yeah it looks you're like hungry all the time ain't you? it looks like it's got a little fade to it but that's actually the color of the, of the flower yeah now some of them will be more kind of all pink some of them will have more white than others you get a little bit of variation out there but i really like the color now the heads on these ain't as big and as kind of perfect as uh the binary giants are but you i do i got more flowers from these than i got from these now the, before i get me another swig of that the binary giant has the most 
vibrant colors of any of the zinnias for me. Look at the reds there, the oranges, the yellows, the purples, and all that. If you're looking for a good, strong color, then you can't. You the can't stems are a little longer on them, a little stronger. You can't beat that Benary Giant. Now, we've sold a bunch of these ice creams this year, <laughs> but. Uh, they make more flowers, I will yeah, say they that. More flowers. And, and they're nice, but they just don't strike me as I like that mix, but now that one over there is, is pretty. But that's not a manly That's type. the one my wife likes yeah, that's the not most. A manly type. I don't know that any of them are, are super manly. But um Well everybody's got a little flower side to them. Yeah. <laughs> is that right? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm gonna just leave I'm gonna leave some that alone. Like some don't, but I I like that one right there. That's just pretty to me. I got some more coming on in my board. Did you plant these others, the ice cream or any of the mothers? I have before, but I got the Benary mix with what I got coming on. And I got a bunch of sunflowers. Uh, speaking of sunflowers, I got a little update here. And I told y'all, a lot of, now a lot of people is getting antsy. Bad antsy. People wanting to order elephant garlic already, and it ain't time to plant elephant no, garlic. No, but you know, we should have it in in just a day or so. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll have it in soon, but I have people within the last couple of weeks, they, they get the itch. Yeah. And people getting the itch about onions, and uh, we, we'll be adding new varieties of onions. Uh, we just restocked the candy onion, and I'll be adding new varieties over the next couple of months. And I will tell you this, because I did it last year, and I know. You can plant... Uh, What's going on there? I just seen where that okra was grown in North Carolina. This here is grown in uh, Virginia. They did a good job. Boy, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Anyway, for taking over here while you talk. You can, you can kind of succession do your onion seed starting. So, and I did that last year. That way you ain't overwhelmed doing it all one time. So like last year, I'd start me one tray one week, a couple weeks later, start me another tray. And I'm gonna do that as a way to try some of these new varieties. Cause you can, even though we say November down here, I planted as late as late November, early December and still been fine. So with that being said, I got two new varieties of short day onions. Now for you folks that don't live in the South, y'all don't need to be growing these. And I'll be adding a bunch of new intermediate day and long day varieties coming up as well. So you can go on our website in the onion pages. We got a little map there. It shows you which ones you need to be planting. These are two new really good commercial grade onion varieties. You won't find these anywhere else. Nobody else is carrying them. Really? Just hoss. I've got one here. A uh, granite, a yellow yellow colored sweet onion it's a granite shape so slightly flattened and this is a jumbo slash colossal type big boy big big onion this variety is called plethora but in other words that's a bragging onion. that's a bragging onion right there so that's plethora that's your yellow sweet slightly flattened or granite type onion just got those in i'm excited about trying those i'm gonna plant me a tray of those while we talking here in just a little bit then I got this one. So last year, I grew some white onions for the first time. And I really like I like the flavor of them. Uh, I just like them a lot. So this is a variety called Carta Blanca. And this is a large to jumbo white onion. Now this is a globe shaped onion, whereas the other one is a granite, meaning it's slightly flattened. Nice big white globe onion here. Both of these varieties, like I said, are commercial grade varieties. Uh, really good varieties, and you're not going to find them anywhere else. Blanco. Carta Blanca and Plethora. I was reading a, 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 some trial studies that uh, University of Georgia did. Um, I should have printed it out. Where they tested about 40 different really, really good uh, short day onion varieties and uh, some of the ones we carry were on there the Savannah Sweet, the Sweet Harvest did really good, the Plethora was on there um, there's another one I got coming that actually kind of beat them all out uh, and we'll talk about that when we get it here I'll let you talk about that for a second okay so this is a new sunflower that we got called Pro Cut Gold Light Sunflower our sunflower breeder that's out in California sent us a sample of these last year. He always throws a little sample in there he wants us to grow and check out. And I, I grew these right here and I, I like them a lot. However, 
when they come out and they and they bloomed, I called them up. I said, "Man, you said this was a uh, this wasn't a branch in some place. This is a pro cut, but mine branch. So don't get a little upset if these branch out on you." Now he said they wouldn't branch, but I can tell you, mine branched out anyway. They still turn out to be perfect, good sunflowers. Make a smaller, bright yellow bloom. You see there. So the the unique thing about this one, if you don't mind me chiming in here, is that most of your sunflowers have a dark colored disc yeah, on them a brown disc. so this is a light colored disc that's why they call it pro cut pro cut gold light it's not like cold beer where the light means you ain't got as many calories the light here means that the disc right. is not dark brown uh so the pro cut gold light this one's also powdery mildew resistant mm -hmm. And with sunflowers, we love to grow those darker colors. I mean, we love all the sunflowers, but I can tell you from experience, the brighter the color, the more that flower stands out in the vase or when it starts to bloom. Yeah, so if you still got a little bit of time and want to plant you one more round, this would be a good one to try. It's going to look nice and pretty for fall. Okay, so this week, as we promised last week, we're going to talk about seed starting. And... Uh, I got a trait. We're about to finish that. We might as well. Let me top mine off because I might liable to get thirsty talking about seed starting. I guess I should have got one of them big jugs of it. Yeah, you should have. That's all right. I'm, I got a feeling I'm going to be up there um, again for too long and I'll stock up. I tell you what's also good. You go to Ella J and get some uh, apple bread. I love this <laughs> It's good stuff. Let's get a, uh, you got your tray over there. We're going to talk about seed starting mix just for a second, okay? Okay. All right, so in the past, uh, I, for years, I have used the uh, uh, Pro Mix. Pro Mix. I had a brain crap there. Pro Mix, and we started carrying that about three years ago. However, I seen there was a little bit different in the Pro Mix we were carrying in the bags versus the big bales some reason there's a little difference in there so we did some testing uh pretty extensive testing over a period of a year to try to find the best pot and soil out there I actually talked to one of our bigger competitors that we're buddies with and he told me they had to get their pot mix out of england because they couldn't find a sustainable or a good pot mix here in the united states and i thought that was weird he said they actually import the pot mix so I kind of went on a uh, ramp there and, uh, and tried a lot of different ones and I settled on this black gold seeding mix. Now we're going to have this in the 8 quart and the uh, 16 quart. This is the 8 quart bag right here. This is the best seed starting mix I have seen, period. And it's also a great microgreen mix. The deal with this right here is it's very consistent and it's very clean, which makes it ideal for a seed starting mix. You know, the, the, the perlite in here is smaller granules a lot smaller. than the perlite in the Pro Mix was, yep. which is interesting. It's just a finer, uh, finer blend, so, what so are you to doing? say. So what I'm doing here is I'm making me some indentions. Cause I'm about to plant me a tray of plethora of onions. And if you don't mind, with your tray over there, if you'll, if you'll plant me a... Um, tray of this Tejama lettuce. That right there, that's my new, well it was last year, I don't guess it's since, anyway that was my favorite lettuce I grew last year. So I got a 338 tray right here and you got a 162 tray right there. Now some people use a pencil for this but uh, well, this. What we like to do, when we put this pot and soil in there, we like to wet it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And after we wet well, don't say pot and soil. Now I get people confused. Know, excuse me, soil, so, so if you if you're not getting it from us and you're going to the store looking for something to start your seeds in, do not do not buy pot and soil. It's too chunky. You got to buy a seed starting mix like we just showed you there. And there are several out there, but uh, get you a good seed starting mix. It needs to be real fine. You don't want a lot of chunks in it. So we talked about that. We're, talk, we're working with trays now. So we just got our big bottom trays in. If you didn't get any of the emails on that, we got a heaping, heaping load of these things in. Yeah, let me expand on the seed mix just for a minute. Now, okay. Expect to pay a little bit more for a good seeding mix than what's going to be in a pot mix at your big box store. Pot and soils at your big box stores a lot of times are just granite pot, I mean, excuse me, pine bark. 
very inconsistent and they just it's cheap i mean if you're going to plant a big old pot or something other they work fine for that but for a seeding mix you got a lot of money invested in seed a lot of time you want to make sure you get a good seeding mix to uh, get you started there are some organic ones out there on the uh on the market and this particular one is organic I do believe, yeah, it's on the list right there. So this is the Omni registered organic seeding mix right here. Just about all of them are. Very few of them, man, very, very few. Some of the miracle Grow ones are probably not on the listed because they may have uh, some, some synthetic stuff in there. I do know they have one, they have come out with a brand of organic pot mix, but most of these are, ours is. And after you wet it good, not a lot, but you just want to get it nice and moist. And when you do that, you can go in there and make these indentions. Now this lettuce that I'm planting here is pelleted. I had a fellow call earlier, and we was he was down in Fort Lauderdale. And we was talking about lettuces, and he asked me about pellet. What, what is that? Well, pelleted lettuce is simply where they take clay and put a coating on the lettuce seed to make it bigger and to make it rounder to make it more consistent. Because lettuce seed, raw lettuce seed is real small, real light, fluffy, and it's real hard to handle. So when you pellet it, it makes it real nice, especially if you're seeding it the way we are here. So I would have re highly recommend that. Now if you're planting on baby lettuce or you're direct seeding lettuce out there, it's not that big of a deal. Raw is fine, because you're going to plant it thick, you're going to cut it down. But put it in these trays, man, this pelleted seed makes it all worthwhile it's easy to get one per thing now if you mess up and get more than one seed in there don't spaz out it's gonna be okay you can come out later and uh, thin them out every now and then i'll have more than one drop in the, in the seed tray there let me talk about just just the just seed starting in general because this is one of the things i feel like a lot of people they they try to Maybe if they, they don't have good success with it, again, it's something they try to work around and they'll be like, well, can I just direct seed my broccoli or whatever? And um, so seed starts is one of those things. It's not that difficult, but the trick is, or it's not really a trick, there's just a certain way to do it. And it's one of those things, if you're the type of person that likes to kind of deviate from what people tell you the right way is to do something, then you might have little struggles with this. These are just, there's a right way to do it and then there's wrong ways to do it and you just kind of got to do it the right way. You know, there's always somebody out there that's going to have to just invent a new way of doing something. Right. So we got our trays here. We got several different types of trays. These are the big commercial grade trays here. I'm gonna be a little while, it takes a little longer on these onions. And uh, we got the 338, which I'm working with here, which works really good for leeks and onions. And then we've got the 162 there, which you're doing with the lettuce. Are you getting close to being done? No, I ain't too far. I had to start getting me some more apple cider. When we talk about planting depth. Did you mention that when you was... No, I just try to indent the soil real good. Now, normally speaking, the smaller you see, the shallower you want to plant it. However, you still want to cover those seeds up good. And it's not a, with these seed starting trays, it's not a huge issue if you do get them a little deep. They seem to do fine because that soil it's nice and soft and it's going to allow that seedling to push up through. It's not like when you're planting out there in the bare ground, you got some of that hard dirt that crusts over. Then you can run into some issues. But this pot is all soft and it normally lets that plant push up through it pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, the general rule is you want your indention to be or your hold to twice the size, you know, twice the diameter of your seed. Uh, but I, I usually find myself poking about the same size hole no matter what I'm planting. I don't really, we don't really transplant a whole lot of real big seeds except when we do those squash or winter, pumpkins winter squash trials. We may have to punch a little deeper hole in the trays when now we do that. This 162 that I'm using is standard in the industry. I mean that's a good tray to plant just about anything. 
uh, tomatoes. You didn't drink peppers, too much apple cider. Yeah, any of that kind of stuff is wonderful. These now the one Trav is using there is a 338. Now 338 is what they call a deep 338, and it is wonderful for onions. And what else would you say? Leeks. Leeks. The big boys grow brassicas in them. Yeah, but that's a, I'm gonna tell you it's a little bit tough. I did grow. I experimented the other day and I grew some sunflowers in one of them compared to this 162. And the sunflowers did a lot better in 162 than it did in that 338. One reason was it dried out a little quicker. So I wasn't able, wasn't able to keep it as wet as I wanted to. So I would recommend growing sunflowers in 162. Now let's talk about watering real quick. So. Uh, one of the big mistakes I see people make, especially with the seed start mix, is they don't get it wet enough. They think it's wet enough, but it'll only be wet on the surface and down there towards the bottom of the cell, it'll be dry as a bone. Now this, this seed start mix takes a lot of water to get it wet initially. And then you'll see some folks, what they do is they mix it up in a bucket or something other water and mix it up and make almost kind of like a paste with it and then they'll pack it down into their trays. Nothing wrong with doing that. It's just a little bit more messy in my opinion. Now this pelleted seed right here is 250 in that pack. And then, yeah, I got two or maybe three and a very few of these. And that, I got, still got a few seeds left over. So one of those packs is more than sufficient to do one of those 162 trays. All right, so once you get, and one more thing, this eight quart bag is enough to do a 338 and to top it off. Just to give you an idea of that, how much pot tools in a okay. uh, eight quart bag. Now, once you get through plant like I did, I'm going to get pot and all in. I ain't going to mess up. Why don't you wait? I just hold off just a second on that, and we'll, uh, We'll I go there. We're wearing that apple stuff. Yeah. Uh, I was in through talking about watering real quick. When you water in these, and we've got a, a fog it mist nozzle on our site, we also got the dram nozzle, it works really good. You don't want to, you want to put your nozzle kind of up here a little bit, not down here. Or blow it out. You don't yeah. want to blow it out. You make a mess. The other thing is, you, um, even if you're bottom, bottom watering with these trays like this, I think it initially it's important to water from the top. Absolutely. And uh, once- That soil is not gonna wick up enough to keep that entire cell wet for those seeds to germinate. Now, if you're using one of the humidity domes with the smaller kits, your moisture is gonna be pretty much preserved in there. But with these guys here, you wanna water from the top until those roots can get to the bottom. And then once those roots can get to the bottom, you can basically have your little reservoir in the bottom here to, to feed them that way. You know, I read a lot of things on the internet, a lot of people talking about fungus gnats. Fungus gnats can be a problem with some people or their trays, but I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever had the first issue. I don't really know why, but I've never had an issue with fungus gnats. Yeah. Maybe it's something to do with the process of what we do it, I don't know. Yeah, I haven't never. Some people were saying that's the whole point of using uh, top dressing with the um, vermiculite, the per perlite, perlite. The three basic components that are in a seeding mix is peat moss, and just about every quality pot mix has Canadian peat moss. Canadians have the best peat moss. Uh -huh. It also has, <coughs> excuse me, vermiculite, vermiculite, and perlite. I must also mention with these onion seeds, these little onion seeds like I'm doing here, you could also not do this in sales. You could just take this tray out, you could fill this with soil and sprinkle them out there, kind of like you uh, do with a yeah, do raised that. bed or yep. something other, because onion transplants are real hardy when you, you can just pull them up by the bunch, separate them real easy because the root system is not super fibrous or so to say they're they're easier to separate than something like a brass so the way be. we did it back and let me give you a back in the day story real quick back in the day back in the day the way things were done was they were seated in one of these bigger trays here without the divider in there and we would seat them in there and we would direct seed to seeds in there whether it be tomatoes or whatever it didn't matter so you would take it and sprinkle it out in there maybe in rows or whatever and you would cover it up 
And once those come up, then you would take you a toothpick or something like a popsicle stick, maybe something a little bit smaller than this, and each individual one you would dig out of there and you would transplant into a bigger cell than this right here, something like a 10, record 10, 20 tray. But you know, that was the acceptable method for just about except any hobbyist that I knew of. Did there. you just say acceptable? I did. Did I, did, I, did I pull that off? Or did I get close? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, That's a new one. Anyway, that was the method that uh, just about everybody did. You know, there weren't a lot of commercial greenhouses back then. So the hobbyists around is pretty much when you did all the, uh, you know, growing transplants. A lot of commercial greenhouses around nowadays. When I was coming up, tomatoes, cabbage, and all that commercially was done in seed beds in the field. And they were lifted. They'd go through with a tractor and lift them up, and they'd pull them up, and they'd set them bare root. So there was hardly any. I oh mean, I can't even remember. Tobacco was the same way. I don't remember any greenhouse operations back when I was coming up. Hmm. Huh. Now. Now it's, it's just. Now it's a very lucrative. Uh, yeah. Business for the, especially in the commercial farming right. world. Okay, I'm done. Sometimes I have a few extra there. I just kind of do this number here. It's kind of like good luck. Okay, we're ready for you to demonstrate the dusting technique. Now we have been doing this a little bit with perlite on top and we could end up carrying some little bags of perlite like this because it works pretty good as well. But uh, we've dusted them with soil for many years too. So you just want to take it in your hand there and kind of just gradually put it on there. What you want to do is you want to cover that seed completely. Sometimes I'll just take my hand and kind of rake it over there and make it nice and flat. While you're doing that, I'm going to talk about heat real quick. Because I had a, I can't remember his name, I had a guy and he was having some issues with getting the seeds to germinate. And we was trying to kind of work through what was happening and turned out he had left his heat mats on. He had left them on all summer long. Mm. Um, and not like they get gradually hotter, but they, it was too hot. So we don't really use heat mats this time of year. Now in the spring, when you're doing peppers and stuff, even tomatoes, uh, maybe even okra, we'll use heat mats if we're transplanting those because the outside temperature is so much cooler. Uh, this time of year, the only issue you may run into is if things are too hot, certain varieties of lettuce or certain brassicas may not germinate in real warm soil temps. Uh, carrots, a lot of times, won't germinate in real warm soil temps. That's why we have to, I like to wait to kind of mid October to plant my carrots. So uh, you don't want to be using a heat mat this time of year. Yep. Unless you lived, I don't know if you lived up there in Alaska or somewhere, you might have to. So the same thing, after we get, you know, the seeds covered up, then you want to take your little mister. And I normally start with the mister, and I missed it for a couple of times. Then I'll move on to the regular, uh, regular spray pattern that comes on that ground hand one there. Uh, in the beginning, yeah, in the beginning, you want to water them till, assuming this bottom tray wasn't here and you could see it. You want to water them so you can see water dripping out the bottom of that tray. Now, if you're in a situation where you can do it all outside, you don't do the bottom tray, that's fine. Blue hatch like on our, in our greenhouse, we have a wire mesh. We don't use the bottom tray. We set this tray on the wire mesh, and I'll go out there, especially when I just seen something, of, I'll water it three to four times a day easily. Yep. You cannot keep it too wet because it's going to drain out. Right? It's going to drain, and this mix has enough perlite in it where it's not really an issue yep. okay lighting let's talk about lighting real quick because the biggest boo-boo people make uh one of the is with seed starting is lighting uh they don't get their lighting right and they're growing them just like this on a table in the kitchen they got fluorescent lights up top there shining down and what happens is that plant sprouts and it's trying to climb towards that light where the intensity yeah. is the highest and uh, it gets leggy on you. It, it happens every single time. In the greenhouse, that light is kind of diffracted, uh, so it's not a big issue. So if you are growing these inside, you got to have some type of light situation. And I'll show you. Can you scoot yours that way? Now we are working on some lighting situations, but it still could be a little bit. So I want to show you a good example 
Now this could be something we carry here. So something like this rig here, this is just an LED light. It's an LED grow light actually. LED grow light. And two of these is enough for this tray here. These have hooks on them. You could hang this from the ceiling or like old Jason at Cog Hill does, you could put you some books on either end there and just add a book as you raise it up. Well, so, the great thing about the LEDs is they don't put off any heat and they're real safe. Now you wouldn't necessarily want to use a relatively fluorescent heat lamp on books. I'm scared that might get a little hot, but these LEDs are safe to use like that. So when you first starting out, you want this baby close like this right here. And then as the plants grow, you're going to ease it up. You want to keep the lights right on top of the plants. You get it way above the plants, they're going to start reaching for it and get leggy. So you need some kind of situation, whether it be stacking books on the end or something hanging from the ceiling, something where you can adjust the height of the light. Now these seeds do not need any light to germinate. But what happens so many times is right when they bust out of that soil there, if they don't have a good light source, they get leggy immediately. So just as soon as they break that soil, you need to have them on a good light, whether it be a grow light or a natural sunlight outside. And that will keep them from getting leggy. The number one problem I see with people growing transplants, the failures they have is leggy plants. And it's frustrating to them, and I completely understand. Mm -hmm. But it can be easily solved. That's right. The last thing to mention is fertilization here. And uh, what we do, what we recommend doing is after you see your first set of true leaves. I'm gonna put them glass on, look a lot smaller than one. Yeah, you, you look more acceptable. Uh, when we see the true leaves or the second set of leaves appear. Now onions, it's a little different because it's, it's hard to tell. But I say on onions, the good rule of thumb is when it drops that seed shell. Um, Cause onion is a monocot. Um, Yes. Correct. So when you get your first set of true leaves or in the onions. The glasses gives me all that. Yeah, time. that's right. That's right. We're going to mix a tablespoon of 20, 20, 20 per gallon of water. And we're going to do that twice a week. And we're going to do it from the top. Mm -hmm. We're going to fertilize them from the top. A tablespoon of 20, 20, 20 per gallon of water. Now, if you say, well, a gallon of water, I'm not going to use a whole gallon of water on water my plants and if you don't you can just mix up a jug a gallon's worth and save it uh, we have even been known to if we we're really wanting to push some plants make a slightly smaller ratio mixture and give it to them every time we water them right when that plant sprouts up those roots are real tender and they're just putting out there and they don't have a lot of roots they're more susceptible to burn at that point the older that plant gets, the more fertilizer you can put to it and the harder you can push it. But you have to be a little bit careful in that first or second fertilization to not burn them. And then just gradually get more than that, making them babies hump after that. Yep. So, that pretty much covers it. Yep. It's not that complicated, folks. It's just a certain way to do it. And if you do it that way, you're going to be successful. All right. Let's... Uh, well, uh, we'll say this. If there was some some reason, no, not a, uh, there was a question you had that we didn't cover uh, tonight, put those in the comments there and we'll be glad to answer them for you. We've got some questions from last week's show we want to answer here. And if we do answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostools.com and we'll send you a nice little prize. The first one is from My Rule Life and it says, please tell me more about it being Irish potato season. I was late getting any started in the spring, but if there's still any hope, I would like your advice. So I just planted, we had that video come out earlier this week. I try, I'm trying me some fall taters. I had some that was still sprouting. I uh, got those in the ground. If you've still got 90 or so days and, and you can get your hands on some taters that are sprouting, you, know, you can still pull it off uh, as we saw in the comments from that video lots of people out there do it all the time pretty successfully so you can still try that as far as uh, Irish potatoes for next year we'll start taking pre-orders for those in December and usually start shipping at the end of January all right and then we have Nita Milfeld and wants to know what causes her pumpkins to rot she said rot off the vine uh, 
don't know if she meant rot on the vine or fall off the vine and then rot. Well, I'll cover a couple different scenarios that could happen either way. If the, if the pumpkins are just coming on and they rot and fall off, then more likely it's a bee issue or a pollinator issue. They didn't get pollinated and they'll throw off. If it is where you're throwing off or you're rotting in some bigger type pumpkins that's already had what we call fruit set, I've been down this road before and I can give you a little a little experience on that. Too much water or too much fertilization will cause them to blow up sometimes. Mm -hmm. Boom, just blow up. Uh -huh. Yeah. Watermelons will do the same thing. If you shoot too much of them at one time and shot that plant, it'll cause that fruit to just explode. So it could be one of two things. When they're small, it's just like squash or anything else. You gotta have good pollination or they'll just rot off if they do you know, set fruit. Or if they're bigger, you gotta be consistent with that water and the fertilization. That's the reason we always preach that drip irrigation because you can be consistent with it. Yeah, I have been known to eat too many boiled peanuts feel like I was gonna blow up. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay, next one's from Donna Zell. She says, when you say overwinter carrots, do you need to put some sort of clover over them? Uh, cut, excuse me, <laughs> some sort of cover over them. Love the shows. You guys are very informative and hilarious. I think she might want me hilarious. Yeah, probably is, yeah. probably is. All right, Donna, so yeah, we overwinter our carrots. I talked about we plant them in October. Harvest them usually end of February, early March. Carrots, the the tops on carrots are cold tolerant down to 18 degrees. So, and if you get colder than 18, you can uh, build you a little, it's really easy to do with some pipe. You can build you a little low tunnel there and cover them up if it's gonna get that cold. I would say if you're consistently, if you're staying below 18 for days and days at a time, you might not wanna try overwintering carrots, but if you're just hitting that every now and then and you can throw a cover on them, that would be good. Um, we don't ever cover ours. Uh, you know, if it does get down to 18 here, it ain't there for long enough, it's not gonna burn them a whole lot. Last one is from E. Anderson, 1801. He says, first year I've grown everything from seeds. The bug pressure has been tremendously lower than buying small plants from stores. From your experience and knowledge, do plants from the nursery and stores bring pests into the garden? Why it's not impossible, it's normally not a problem because pests can move around a lot. The biggest problem we see with plants that come from nursery, they're not healthy plants. And insects, just like uh, on plants, are just like viruses or sicknesses on us. They can sense a weak plant. Mm -hmm. So when they sense that weak plant, then they jump on it. For some reason, though, the people have always wanted to buy these gigantic plants from the nursery, from the... Uh, Big old mater store. plant. Big old mater plants. And that plant is root-bound. It's stressed. So when you bring it home and plant it, those, those uh, insects sense that it's stressed. Uh, disease jumps on it. So that's your biggest problem right there is those stressed out plants from nursery. They've sat there on that hot asphalt last few days. They ain't been watered. They ain't been loved. So there you have it. A nice, young, tender growing plant is going to be able to fight off those insects and diseases better than those old root bound plants from the nursery. Yeah, that old boy that works in there at the trash supply come five o'clock or whatever. Last thing on his mind is watering them plants before he yep. goes home. So uh, you're gonna have some problems there a lot of times. All right, well that's gonna do it. I got to get some more mix so I can finish topping off my onions there. Yes, you do. And uh, hope everybody enjoyed the show tonight. Like I said, if you have any more questions about seed start, definitely let us know. Also let us know how your seed start is going along. I know we're behind probably most people out there. Uh, most people are a little more on the ball. I've seen some people getting fall transplants in the ground already. Yep. Um, so. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to give us a big thumbs up, hit that like, share button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and hit the bell button so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy tonight's video, here's a couple more videos on seed starting. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll see you next time. Take care.